I want to tell you about a new podcast called Amuse News. Publishing multiple days a week, Amuse News is your source for food news, interviews from around the food world, and more. On the show, we'll be engaging with food storytellers, from chefs to advocates to people working in the field, and many more. Find Amuse News wherever you get your podcasts. Amuse News is a destination for everyone who's looking for a new, insightful look into the world of food. Today's program has been brought to you by Heritage Foods USA, the nation's largest distributor of heritage breed pigs and turkeys. For more information, visit heritagefoodsusa.com. I'm Greg Blaze, host of Cutting the Curd. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit heritageradionetwork.org for thousands more. Radio Network. We are coming to you live, as always, from the back of Roberta's Pizza here in Bushwick, Brooklyn. You're listening to The Farm Report. I'm your host, Aaron Fairbanks, and today we're continuing our conversation on the sheep and lamb industry here in the U.S. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, technology and how different uh, tech advances are being adapted or not adapted here in the States and, and how we should be thinking about them. We're joined again on the line by John Wilkes, who's my co-producer on this series. John, welcome to the show. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for the for the for those warm words. Yes, looking forward to the show. I'm armed with a nice big mug of tea, ready to roll. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, so I guess we should start by by talking a little bit about we you know what we mean when we say technology. What kind of things? are included in that and, and maybe what kind of things aren't. You know, I don't want folks out there thinking we're talking about spaceships and lasers when we're, you know, when we're really talking about something um, else. But what, what are some of the objects in the realm of the tech space as it relates to the livestock industry? Well, in, in relation to the sheep industry, um, uh, we have, hopefully have uh, uh, Professor Reed Redden coming on, who is... Um, on the NSIP, which is the National uh, Sheep Industry sort of program, which is looking to research and find ways to introduce the technology. So the technology really, it, technology, uh, the, the main um, uh, thing that they're into is uh, estimated breed values. And using the technology of uh, ultrasound to uh, take measurements uh, of the animal as it's growing, for at various points in its life to ascertain the amount of meat that it's carrying. And then these figures are then put into a, uh, other numbers which are gathered weights at weaning and birth weights. And so the technology really is, is taking all these various uh, pieces of information, birth weights, birth numbers, um, then the resultant animal, the amount of meat it's carrying, and putting it all into a figure, an estimated breed value, EBVs, which is uh, banded around. And this then gives an indication of the uh, that animal's sire, or the producer of that animal, uh, if he uh, is going to be uh, looked to improve a breed and going to uh, have characteristics which you would find uh, acceptable and look to improve your production. Um, so, so, so that, that's uh, uh, around the technology side. That would I'm trying to keep it simple, but uh, does that kind of make sense? I think so. Let me let me kind of throw it back at you and can tell me what I'm getting right or what I'm getting wrong. So, kind of uh, going down a path uh, of using ultrasound technology to get a sense of what essentially the baby lamb is kind of looking like and will look like when it hits the ground. Is that right? Yeah, uh, that, that's a difference. Uh, that is the ultrasound which is used in pregnancy detection. The, the ultrasound can also be used uh, in, in relation to um, the the maturing animal. It's in measuring the actual uh, depth of meat on the animal's loin. So, so, so that the the ultrasound can be used, yes, in pregnancy detection, but also for uh, more importantly to assess. Um, the animal at a later stage to see how much meat it's carrying. So, and then, 
Oh, well, yeah, let on. me just jump in there. So, so you have a lamb that, or, you know, sheep that's growing and you want to essentially kind of like take a time out and look inside of it to see yeah. how it's progressing. So exactly. Um, now, is this more of a like a, a, a research tool, or is this something that kind of you know producers are going to be looking to incorporate for for their kind of regular production? Well, it's it's hoped that um, it, the, the uptake is with the actual breeders, the actual breeders of the uh, stock rams uh, and the and the breeding sheep that, that will then be used then commercially to produce the lamb. So when you're selecting a sire for your um, lamb production flock, you're you're going to be looking for an animal that that has been assessed so that you know that uh, potentially this animal, the progeny um, from that animal will give you an advantage that they may grow quicker. Um, Birth to sort of weaning weights are assessed and and, uh, the speed an animal will lay on meat are looked at. And the reading of the fat, as the meat in the animal, uh, and the number of animals that are born. So the the idea is this information is then used to um, score your potential sire that you're going to use in your flock. So obviously, the higher the breed value, this animal is indicated that in the progeny that it produces, you will get more lambs, and they will be they will be a better shape, and they will have more meat. So so that's kind of trying to simplify it. Um, uh, best I can. Yeah, no, no, that makes sense. And so I guess ultimately if you get in there and take a peek and, you know, there's not a great loin development, would the decision then be to not, you know, breed that animal or use that use that animal for breeding stock? Or what do you do um, if it's, like, not it what you want? I would say how bad it was. Um, it, it, it's an indication, obviously, um, that uh, that animal potentially won't produce as good a carcass. And, and the thing about a carcass, of course, is visually you can appraise a sheep, but it's only when it's hanging up that you can actually see what's going on internally. So that the, the ultrasound does, uh, as you say, an, an animal that perhaps is intimating in its breed score mm-hmm. as, as, a, as a producing ram... Perhaps it isn't showing particularly good, uh, you know, loin development is one you might not want to look at. And that will reflect in a lower score because it's basically a cumulative figure that is that each animal has. And it takes into account these various subsections to give you a value. So obviously an animal with a with a with a lower loin score is, is going to be lower down the scale. Um, so it, 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 in that sense, the ultrasounds, you know, uh, uh, very helpful, very useful. And as you hit on um uh, earlier, it can also be used for uh, counting the fetus during pregnancy of of the ewe, and there, therefore the ultrasound is a valuable management tool so that the shepherd or the flock master can then um, know how many animals are inside the ewe physically to then adjust feeding in the latter stages of pregnancy to um, greatly enhance the, the survival rates and the and the birth weights of the individual lambs being born. So it's, it can be used for two two purposes. And in the application of the ultrasound technology, is there, you know, kind of a uh, a, a wandering kind of ultrasound tech who performs this analysis for producers, <coughs> or would the idea be that producers would kind of get trained up to be able to do this and? And kind of on that note, are we talking about producers at a certain scale here as like a, you know, a ripe target for the uptake of this particular uh, resource? Well, it, it's, it's a useful resource um, at any scale, whether you have 20 use or 200 or 2,000 use. It's, it's an incredibly valuable management tool, both for feeding and also at actual lambing time. So the actual scale of producers are relevant. Um, the cost of machines, uh, that are, uh, a Scottish company are quite big here now. Because um, actually in, in another life, I used to do this um, in the UK professionally for many years. I used to ultrasound scan many thousands of sheep every year. So I, uh, I, it's kind of my baby, if you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, and, and, and the company that I used way back then are actually in the United States now. They're based up uh, because uh, the ultrasound is used an awful lot within the dairy industry, as you can imagine, for pregnancy detection. So that that's their main driver. But they they are the pretty well foremost maker of a sheep uh, scanning machine, 
And it, it's very slick now. I mean, even down to the fact that you can have the machines with actual goggles, but you don't look at the screen anymore. You're looking at, uh, you're like a fighter pilot in an aeroplane. You have goggles on them with the screens superimposed on that. So the technology has come a long way since I was doing it. And I want to talk a little bit about kind of the, the ick factor, the yuck factor, though, like, whoa, this is like, you know, science. Is, you know, for consumers, I feel like there is a, like, the idea of ultrasounding your animals and, and that kind of like focus and level of detail, it's not, it doesn't sit with the image of, you know, the farmer who's in tune with the land and in tune with their animals and is, you know, um, how do we kind of make that transition for people? I mean, there's, you say the word ultrasound, it, you know, it just brings up a score of other kind of connotations. And I'm wondering how has the uh, kind of response been? And, yeah. how, and how do you anticipate consumers understanding the use of this technology? Well, first, you, you, you have to uh, understand that ultrasound is completely safe across the country. Hundreds of thousands of people are ultrasounded every day, physically themselves. Ultrasound is used for, uh, you know, even for in, in uh, prenatal units. It's totally safe. It's totally safe. And, and I think the message to get to, to the consumer, whether you're using it as part of uh, the EBV score for a potential ram sire to find a, a better, more meaty ram, or if you're using it um, as a tool to... Uh, help you find out how many lambs are physically inside each each animal. Um, there is no danger with it, and particularly in the ultrasound pregnancy side of things, it's a, it's, um, it can save lives. I mean, it, it, it works to the benefit of the mother in you. Um, the ultrasound will tell you the number of animals, so if a ewe is carrying three little tiny lambs, you know that, and therefore you're able to feed that ewe to a sufficient level to make certain that she has three healthy, viable little lambs as opposed to sort of smaller lambs that would have needed the you would have needed more feeding in later pregnancy if you know what I mean so so that so it, it, it's very much a positive thing that I can't see any negative aspects to it at all it is totally safe and it's about um, and it's helping the product it, it's helping the farmer at the EBV side of things produce a better lamb and um, if producing a better product is at the expense of using some technology, if the technology is proven to be safe, totally safe, I, I think it's a, I think it's a win win for everybody. And can can you kind of give us some insight into how this technology is being used or not used in the U.S. in comparison to other kind of major sheep and lamb producing parts of the world? Yeah, yeah, I can. It's a shame that Reed is non because uh, Reed has just come back, I think, or fairly recently from Australia where um, this uh, EBV uh, breed evaluation is, is, has been going on for many years. I mean, the Australian, their, their use of technology and their use of uh, detail into breeding um, is, is very, very, uh, well, it's legendary. They, they, they devote a lot to it. It's a big industry. So, so they're using that kind, of, uh, that kind of technology there. In the UK, we have uh, a similar situation where most pedigree flocks are uh, are part of a scheme where they have their uh, the breed values of their individual rams are available when you go to buy the ram. So, it, it and, the, and I would imagine New Zealand is probably the same. It's the, the U.S. for some reason. Interestingly, the EBVs are used extensively here within the cattle industry, I believe, and probably in the pig industry as well. But for some reason, there seems to be a, a disconnect to get it to be so uh, to get the uptake. Within the sheep sector, within the sheep sector, which so. is kind of um, you know I can't kind of understand it, but uh, I believe that's the case. Well, we are going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to be joined by Brett Taylor, um, who can maybe give us a little insight um, on that particular question. So hang tight; we'll be right back. You're listening to the Heritage Radio Network. This is the Farm Report. Stay tuned. <laughs>
listening to the fabulous Conti family, You've Got Me Going Baby. I'm not leaving the sex to see you're someone real. No, I'm not gonna go and leave you behind. Since 2001, Heritage Foods USA has sold pasture-raised, antibiotic-free heritage meats to restaurants and homes around the country. Our farmers raise their animals with care using traditional methods guaranteed to produce the very best tasting meat. Our pork breeds include Berkshire, Red Wattle, Duroc, Gloucester Old Spot, Large Black, and Tamworth, and our beef comes from Piedmontese, Angus Akiyushi, Belgian Blue, Highland, Simmental, and Belted Galloway cattle. We also carry a rotation of 24 rare breeds of heritage chicken, seasonal specialties like lamb, goat, geese, and of course, heritage turkeys. Visit us online at www.heritagefoodsusa.com or give us a call at 718-389-0985 to place your order today. Hey, what's up? This is John Norris and you're listening to the Heritage Radio Network. All right, we are back after a very jazzy break. Thanks for that, Liz. We are, uh, you've tuned into the Farm Report on the Heritage Radio Network, and we are continuing our conversation on the sheep and lamb industry. Um, in the first part of the show, we were joined by John Wilkes, who's my co producer on this series. And in the second half, we're bringing in Brett Taylor. Um, Dr. Taylor is a research animal science scientist. He works with the USDA and runs the U.S. Sheep Experiment Station. He's out in Boise, Idaho. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you. So, um, you know, we are focusing a little bit this talk on, um, you know, technology in the sheep and lamb industry and, and definitely want to uh, get some of your thoughts on that. But before we before we move forward in that area, can you give us um, just kind of the lay of the land? What is a sheep experiment station? Oh, that's a very good question, and, and one that's uh, uh, it, it, it's curiosity in many people's, many people's head. Well, the U.S. Sheep Experiment Station, also known as the Range Sheep Production Efficiency Research Unit, was actually the USDA's um, answer to begin solving many of the sheep industry's questions as far back as 1915. So next year would be our 100-year anniversary. And... Um, since then, um, our research has focused on sheep that are suitable and sheep that can produce in these Intermountain West environments uh, in, in Idaho and Montana, Utah, Wyoming, and, and the Pacific West. And, in fact, proof of that is is that uh, early 20s we released the Columbia breed, later 20s we released the Targhee breed, and in the 70s the Polypay. But in, mixed in with that is is also doing research on these uh, sagebrush, sagebrush ecosystems that these sheep are, are raised in. So... Really, to kind of sum it up, over the past hundred years, that's that's the focus of a lot of our a lot of our research. So, for yourself, can you give us an example of what like a typical you know work week might include? Like, what are some of the actual kind of on the ground tasks that you're doing? Yeah, great question too. Um, you know, there's currently some of our latest work, at least specifically dealing with sheep. A lot of our focus over the past six or seven years has been in the terminal sires. Many producers ask, you know, which sire would be best to accomplish the goal for my flock, depending on what the end product use or where their market is or where they want to sell their lambs at. So a lot of our, our research over the past seven or eight years has been sampling the nation's um, uh, different sire types and, and measuring what does each of these breeds and what's available in these breeds. That, Dr. Uh, Taylor, I'm just going to jump in real quick. Cause can you, just for folks who may not know what a sire is, we just, just so, sure. yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's your ram. That's, that's the, uh, that's, uh, I guess, uh, uh, you know, that's the daddy of the flock. Uh, Got it. And so if we want to improve, you know, if we want to improve our flock to meet whatever production goal that we want, whether it be wool or whether it be a meat, a meat product is, is we're going to focus on our sires. We're going to focus on those rams that are available in the industry to achieve our goals and to move our flock where we want it to be. So a lot of our work has been in that in the past seven or eight years to evaluate breeds and evaluate within those breeds the best rams for the producer. And so that's kind of an example of there, both on the meat side and, and the wool side. So that's some of our, our current work directly uh, with, with sheep. So, for example, um, if you're, can you give us, a, like, in the, in the meat space and then in the wool space, when you're talking about kind of sire evaluation, 
you know, what are some of the things that you're that you're looking for that that folks are preferencing? And if you can give us a sense, because you guys have been, you know, working over the past century, how kind of um, trendy is what people are looking for? How much does that you know change, or do things come in and out of fashion, or is it we've kind of been looking for the same characteristics? We're just kind of getting better and better and better in the same directions. Does that make sense? Oh, it does, and you know, really, it's 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 it, it, it's a combination of the both. I think that you know, the same old every year after every year. We know that for any type of of, uh, of agricultural product and things like that, that 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 kind of process and that that approach, you know, it does kind of fade out. Uh, and 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 we have to stay with those trends, with those preferences of those consumers, while also trying to balance what we can actually produce. You know, the environments across the United States for sheep production are so diverse. And you know we really we really need to be realistic in what products that we want to go after in our sheep based upon the environment that we're producing in. So if we look at something like the sire, we know that 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 um, that what the American consumer wants in terms of what type of lamb do they want to consume? What do they want to see on that dinner plate? Um, there's a variety of different markets there, from the ethnic markets that may want uh, a cut of meat or or something that's uh, smaller in size, whereas we can look at uh, um, uh, the large restaurant, high-end restaurant industries that want to see a, a much larger cut of lamb for some particular dish that they're serving. So this is where, when we look at these sires and the different breeds throughout the United States, we can see what 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 ram can that producer purchase, like I said, to go back and, and, and target whatever market that that producer has identified that they want to sell their lambs in. And so that kind of brings it back to something. Same thing with the wool. We see that, uh, you know, still... Uh, wool. People want wool. People want to wear wool. We see a lot of blended products, some wool with some synthetics. But, you know, one thing that's been established since the beginning of time, people don't want that itchy wool. So we're still, you know, we're still trying to pursue that really high quality uh, wool, the fine wool, the things that we want to wear close to our skin. Uh, uh, and then again, you know, we're going to go out and, and, and see what breed and, and what rams within that breed do we want to bring that quality into our flock. So I might have you to thank for a soft wool sweater some point in the future? <laughs> no, not me. You need to just always <laughs> thank the American producer. The American producer, I mean, we, we, can, we, can, you know, we can provide guidance and, and, and explore where a producer may not have the money or time to investigate. That, that's what a research, that's what a sheep research institution is, is to explore where producers just don't have the time or resources. But we always got to thank the American producers. They, you know, they're, they're really, they've always been there. Uh, uh, opening the doors and really stretching the, the potential of the, U- the U.S. American sheep. And how do producers find out about your work? I mean, how do they kind of know to, to go to you? How do you report to them or, or share the findings that you have? And, and how dynamic is that, like as things are moving along and you're taking on different projects? Yeah, really, we, we work from, from the base up. We, we try, when we can, we always want to cooperate with the, the state's land-grant institution through their Cooperative Extension Research Service. I mean, that, that is the real individual that can deliver those products straight to those producers. So, so we want to utilize that as much as possible. As far as my specific work or a lot of the scientists in the agencies that I work with, is um, uh, they're right there with the stakeholders in, in like a sheep association meeting for that particular state or neighbor, neighboring states. Then we work it up from there uh, to um, uh, to the uh, the national level, and that's where we can kind of update producers uh, on our current work and some of our, our our current deliverables. But there are people, you know, people these days, each year more and more, just m- relying more and more on gathering their information on the web and the internet. Internet. And you can go to the Agricultural Research Service, that's the agency that I work for, uh, on the web, and the information staff at the Agricultural Research Service has made all of our publications uh, available to where a person can go up and click on that particular publication and pull it down and read it. And then, and then also just one-on-one, you know, producers mm-hmm. will call me and, and we'll just, you know, we'll uh, shoot the bull or shoot the ram, I guess, for in sheep production and, <laughs> and talk about the, the things that we do. Well, so one of the things John and I were talking about in the first half of the show was um, ultrasound technology and how that's being used. And one of the things that, um, you know, we were kind of, I was kind of wondering about is how um, the U.S. sheep and lamb, you know, producers compare with their uptake of different technologies, you know, ultrasound being one of them. 
um, how, how we compare with producers in different parts of the country. Um, and one of the points that he mentioned was that um, even within the U.S., when you look across different types of livestock, the pork industry or the beef industry, for some reason, the sheep and lamb industry seems to be a little bit behind the curve with regards to technology adaptation. I mean, would you agree with that? Has that been kind of, does that ring true to kind of what you're seeing? Somewhat, but, you know, a little background on that. It's certainly, it's not, it, it's certainly not from the lack of desire or the lack of understanding of the technology. I think that the majority of sheep producers that I visit with, uh, and, and most of my, inter, uh, most of my interaction is, is, is in the, in the West, uh, but still all over, uh, I, I think it's the coordination of those efforts. We know that um, uh, we know that those technologies are, are are expensive, and even expensive from the standpoint of a cooperative. So, if you have a cooperative sheep grower group, even sometimes it's a little bit expensive to invest there. Uh, but also on the other side, as far as if there are service companies that can provide that service again, uh, I think it's then it's a it's a critical mass. Uh, you know, are there enough sheep? You know, in the United States, to 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 really fund any person developing a business in ultrasound technologies to service just just sheep. So sometimes I think there's a lack of critical mass for them to make themselves available. So you can go throughout the United could, could States. I, could I jump in just a second? Yeah, John, okay. I was just about to ask if you had. Brett. Some, yeah. Hi, hi, Brett. How are you? Fine, fine. Good. On the on the uh, just quickly on the ultrasound pregnancy detection side of things. I, I know that there is, it's a bit of a gray area and that um, basically in, in some states it can only be performed by um, veterinarians, even though it's just a purely non-invasive uh, process. In the UK and in Australia and New Zealand, the ultrasound pregnancy detection can be undertaken by any competent contractor. You haven't got to be licensed, I don't think, uh, uh, you know, because if you're any good, you, you come back next year. If you're accurate, you do, and if you do, you, and if you don't, you come back. Uh, you don't come back. I, I was just wondering about in, in the U.S., in, as you explained, with the being a sort of a spread-out industry, um, is there much incentive for, say, independent contractors to be able to work to do the ultrasound work? Well, I think it's dependent on what, um, you know, where they want to apply the ultrasound. You know, if it's, if it's certainly looking at uh, growth characteristics of the particular animal, mowing on and things like that, it's certainly probably a different deal. And I'm not sure from state to state because, you know, like... John, like you said, in the United States, you know, from state board, you know, from border to border, the rules can change real quick. Over to pregnancy diagnosis, um, but I do know in the Intermountain West, you you will see small regions where, and I don't know as, as far as for each state, um, the certification or or things that they must and must not have. But there have been a groups and small uh, businesses that, that that can cater cater to that. But but was and, and, and John, you brought me right to it. But that was kind of the point I was wanting to make. So. You will see throughout the United States, and, and, and like very importantly pointed out, you know, regulations have a lot to do with it and certifications, but you'll see maybe a small business that can service. And, and my point in all that was is where those businesses are available and where they're legal, uh, legally applied uh, and, and used, you know, sheep producers are they're very eager to, eager to utilize that, but it's just we just don't see that availability you know, in all 50 states so that, that all producers can, can have the opportunity to benefit off that. Right, so it's more of a question of kind of the infrastructure and those resources rising up to meet, you know, where the where the producers are. Because I'm assuming, like, often those aren't the same groups of people who are, you know, producing and, and building the infrastructure with regards to the tech intervention. And, like, is that stuff mostly coming not from producers but from people who are in the industry but not, producing does that make sense john am i like am i kind of getting that right there yeah i i i would say um i, I would say so it, it it's about um yeah it, it, it's about people within the industry deciding they want to do stuff as, as brett implied but the costs for small groups of producers can be prohibitive which is a shame but uh, obviously a fact given that the industry is so spread out it's you know um a big country and not many sheep. So, Dr. Taylor, kind of thinking about um, other focuses for your area of work, um, I'm curious if you can talk at all about, um, you know, disease prevention, parasite issues, if there's other things that are kind of common across the industry that um, 
our particular focus at the experiment station? Oh yeah, you know, and and you know, here's the deal. I, I I'm not going to be able to provide you anything in terms of, of parasites. I I tell you what, when I moved up here to the Intermountain West, and especially in these large uh, production systems that are on the sagebrush steppe, you know, vast landscapes. Is, that believe it or not, and I know this is hard for some people to believe, but parasites, internal parasites, are not, not a problem. So, you know, it's it's that, that's I guess that's kind of one of our inabilities to research here is parasite internal parasite problems. Just you got to have the, the problem. So it, that's that that is a nice thing. Each each region in the United States has something nice about the production system, and that's one of the things here. But but disease, yes, very very important. Um, our partner, and it's almost I, 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 each day goes by, I refer to it more as a system as a sister lab. And that's the um, the uh, same agency, Agriculture Research Service, but that's the Animal Disease Research Unit run by Don Knowles in Pullman, Washington. We work hand-in-hand in hand with exploring that, how to look at flocks that, uh, that you know, I, I, I think we, management system-wise, I think that, that we in the United States and even worldwide, we, we understand what we need to do to reduce the incidences of disease in our flocks, you know, proper vaccination, uh, you know, proper cleanliness in our production field facilities and things like that. But I think we're at the next step to where we do see that some of our sheep and the flocks, they seem to never get sick, yet there's others that do get sick, just like, you know, I mean, we see in humans and all other types of animals. And so our cooperation and, and is, is, is at the uh, Animal Disease Research Unit, uh, Stephen White, Michelle uh, Musel, Dave Schneider, those guys and gals, they, they, they focus on genetically, do we see animals based on looking at the genetic component of that animal? I mean, the molecular biology part of the molecular genetics. Can we see some marker that seems to be associated with these animals that never get sick? And if we can identify that, can we then turn around and capitalize that on our breeding program and then to explore flocks that are just overall more resistant to certain types of diseases that used to plague us in the past? So that is, that is some of our current efforts with that particular group, I think it's exciting. I think it's appropriate, uh, and I think that that's you know that's that's where that's where we need to move. But we also need to be cautious when we look at disease resistance. Remember, in genetic selection, when we start chasing one trait, we can also lose traits that are very important to us in the background. Traits that have to do with growth and efficiency and quality of wool and things like that. So that's what I think makes the nice marriage between the units and what we look for is is, is we can pursue this disease resistance or disease tolerance, but at the same time make sure we're not losing those traits and qualities that make American sheep, you know, so wonderful and so awesome. Right, you're kind of taking a more holistic point of view. Exactly. And matching it to that environment, we just can't forget, you know, we can't forget that environment. And, you know, one, as far as technology that's out there, and uh, Michelle Musel uh, had published this work, this is in Journal Animal Science, is, is is we always want to encourage our producers and, and our producer co-ops to consider technologies such as needless vaccinations, such, such as the new, pneumatic technologies that are out there. Uh, there's many companies out there, well, not many, there's several companies out there, both Canada and the United States, that have needless vaccination technology for sheep. And what was established, what we did the research here is, is are we getting the, the vaccination effect that we want with needleless vaccination, dealing with wool. You know, cattle, it's easy. You know, slick hide, slick hair. But when you're having to deal with, deal with wool, are we getting that, that result the same thing as using a needle? Because we know if we can get away from needles, we can eliminate a lot of lateral transfer of diseases, especially for people that still refuse to, to change needles. And also we can get away from the damage that needles can occur in terms of the meat quality or carcass or whatever it may be. And so we see this as a real. This is something that we... Uh, have been using steadily. We encourage producers to explore needless vaccination in terms of the pneumatic type technologies for their flocks. We, we think that's very important, reducing the disease and also protecting carcasses and pelts and whatnot. So, so anyway, those are kind of some of the current, you know, things that we're doing in terms of disease. Right, right. And well, what about also kind of with regards to kind of, you know, nutrient mixes or different kind of um, you know, deficiencies or like how things kind of shift, um, you know, from region to region where there's uh, dietary concerns. Very good. Yeah, selenium has always been a huge interest for us here. When we look at the upper Midwest or the East Coast um, and the West Coast, uh, selenium deficiency is, is and in, in parts of the Intermountain West, selenium deficiency, whether it's extreme deficiency or marginal deficiency, is very prominent in all those flocks. If you don't have, even for us humans, 
as well as the animals that we raise. If we're deficient on selenium, we tend to die earlier. We tend to be sick more often. In our livestock, we see reproductive failure. Just their animals are just failing to reproduce. So it's a very, very important nutrient. There are good solutions for managing selenium deficiency. Sodium selenide is your most common selenium salt that you find in supplements for us, supplements for animals. But what we've found in some of these very extensive uh, production systems, a lot of times our ability to provide supplements on a weekly basis or a daily basis are, are somewhat prohibitive. I mean, some of our sheep flocks, you have to, it takes three hours by horseback to access them, so you certainly can't haul a mineral mix back in there. Right. Our goal was just to look for, is there any way to, is there any source of selenium that we can provide them that will last a long time? And indeed, we did find a natural source that's, uh, 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 it's, it's in high selenium feeds that we see grown in the uh, Dakotas. And we can take co-products like a wheat grain, we can take a co-product wheat grain like wheat middlings, and uh, we can feed that. It's rich in selenium, but only from the grains in the Dakotas and in those certain regions. But we can feed that. And we found that when we feed that, we can, we can boost the selenium status of that animal. It'll last for six months. We don't have to provide it, you know, every day. And that's just a 21-day feeding period. And we've been working with the Intermountain Farmers Association, who's uh, a cooperator with us out of um, Salt Lake City, who we're in the process right now of developing. Hopefully, soon we'll have a marketable product uh, for sheep producers. But... That's been very important for us in a, in a very long-fought <laughs> research process that we've been committed to. Wow. Well, unfortunately, we are just about out of time. I think, you know, for me, the most interesting, interesting I think, takeaway from what we're hearing from you is that, like, with regard to technology, there's just a lot to think about, um, you know, different regions of the country, the kind of how it will impact, how, how the ease of um, kind of use for, for producers, the cost, um, and it's really neat, John, to have your perspective on here as well to give us a little bit of a flavor of, you know, what's happening or what's working in different parts of the world as well. So I want to thank you both so much for joining us. It's been a really interesting conversation. Oh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Excellent. So definitely stay tuned. Uh, we will be continuing our sheep talk uh, next next Thursday. We're going to be taking a look about at sheep in the global market, so kind of continuing this conversation um, once again, I want to thank my guest, Dr. Taylor, and my co-producer on this series, John Wilkes. It's been really great having you both on. This episode of The Farm Report, like all 39 of our live weekly shows, is available for free. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher Smart Radio, but I hope you'll visit our website, www.heritageradionetwork.org. We are a member-supported organization, so if you believe in our work, I hope you'll consider clicking that Donate tab and becoming a member today. Thank you so much for listening, and stay tuned in. Thanks for listening to this program on heritageradionetwork.org. You can find all of our archive programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can email us questions anytime at info at heritageradionetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a 501c3 nonprofit. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening. Hey, listeners, we're nearing the end of our 15th anniversary fundraising campaign, and we need your help to meet our goal. This campaign offers you a chance to win a unique food and music experience in one of the most exciting cities in America. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and you'll be entered to win dinner for two and two tickets to a concert in one of eight amazing cities. New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Ardmore, Pennsylvania, and Asheville. All donations support our work educating food system storytellers. And when you donate, you can choose one of those cities and you'll be entered to win dinner and two tickets to a show. So help us reach our goal and enter to win dinner and a show in the city of your choice. Check out heritageradionetwork.org slash 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org slash 15. Thank you.